doing things militarily until we can have a wall and proper security. We're going to be guarding our border with the military. That's a big step. We really haven't done that before, or certainly not very much before. But we will be doing things with Mexico, and they have to do it. Otherwise, I'm not going to do the NAFTA deal. NAFTA has been fantastic for Mexico, bad for us. And, you know, I, as I mentioned, I heard with them making great progress in the NAFTA negotiations, and they could be making a big announcement in a week. He said, I'll pull the rug out from the whole thing unless I get some cooperation on the border. I get it. You know, whether they're going to pay for the wall or not, I'll see. And this, keep in mind, too, you mentioned the $1.6 billion. In, uh, but basically, you can't spend that much in six months. So in six months, they go back again. And this president said, this is the last time I'm signing anything like this. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is the provision in the omnibus that says don't build any of those prototypes. That is a thumb in your eye. That's pure politics. That's not good's good for the country. And I think that was what really bothers him uh, the most. So he's saying to Democrats who are resisting him and establishment Republicans who have never truly been committed to border security, if you're not going to do it, then I'm going to send in the military because we have a crisis on our border, drugs. Mm -hmm. gangs, terrorists, whatever it is, and we think the military can help with that. Now, before the left freaks out and says, we're militarizing it, he understands there's something called the Posse, Posse Comitatus Act that forbids the U.S. military from law enforcement action. So this will be carefully crafted to either include the National Guard under state orders uh, or limited surveillance activities to support the Border Patrol agents mm -hmm. in a layered way. This has also been done before, before everyone freaks out and says this is just President Trump's war on illegal immigrants. Barack Obama did it, George W. Bush did it, and I, I would predict this president does it probably more robustly because it's far more committed to defending the border than right. either of those two presidents. Right. Democrats and Republican presidents have done this in Correct. the past. You're right. And you know what? I think the, the situation is just going to get worse because all of these people that are in that caravan that are coming up, word is starting to spread that it's easier to get into the United States. I don't even know if many of you knew about catch and release and exactly what that meant until this caravan starts walking up and we start talking about it more and more. Right. It's going to stop because these, these 1,200 are sitting in a soccer stadium wondering, do I have to go back or am I going to go forward? I have news for you. If you're watching, you're not going forward. Meanwhile, let's change gears. The Washington Post uh, had a story yesterday that Robert Mueller, uh, Robert Mueller's people let the president's law, legal team know that he is not a target of investigation. However, not, he is being investigated. He's not a criminal target. He is being investigated, but not a criminal target, which I guess means right. hasn't committed a crime. As yet. Nine months later, all these Democrat lawyers, Bob Mueller himself, this whole, the whole thing together, and we know now today, admitted to his attorneys, as Brian said, he's not currently a criminal target, although the investigation remains and he is around the investigation, obviously. But nine months! Oh, not a target. But we don't really know what they got. We don't really know what they're doing. We know this. It is a wide scope. They're pulling in a Dutch lawyer because of what his uh, con what he li lying about a contact with a Russian I never heard of. Rick Gates, uh, Paul Manafort, others. Brian, we don't know, but uh, cut they deals, be, Mike Flynn. Wouldn't they be but going they're all for things unrelated. If they had anything on him, though, Brian, they'd be going after him. Yeah. yeah. Well, Alan Dershowitz, the Harvard professor, he's been on our show, a bunch, Democrat. He was on with Sean Hannity last night. Listen to what he said. Special counsel should have very narrow jurisdiction, and it should be set out in advance so everybody can see it and know it. You know, the Constitution talks about ex post facto criminal laws. The policies behind that are fair warning and constraining the government. And the government, when you have a special prosecutor, should know and everybody should know what he's entitled to look and what he's not entitled to look at. This special prosecutor is going to look at everything. He's, he's beginning to look at President Trump's personal financial matters before he was president. Will he start looking at the women who are uh, alleging uh, actions against him? Where does it stop? We know that the Clinton special counsel started with white water and ended up with a blue dress. And that's Where? just wrong. Just stop, and that's the biggest question. Finally, they're just trying to get the president to speak. Uh, many people don't think it's, they're going to close it without getting him to answer questions in some way. And if you're not a target, and if you say one thing that doesn't match up with your hundreds, maybe thousands of witnesses that have had sworn testimony, yep. then he could become a target just like that. Absolutely. You're right. Me meanwhile, seven minutes after the top of the hour, I was really disturbed by this when the president said this last week on Thursday on an infrastructure speech, said, in Syria... I'm ready to get the troops the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. And then he said this yesterday. I want to get out. I want to bring our troops back home. I want to start rebuilding our nation. We will have, as of three months ago, $7 trillion 
in the Middle East over the last 17 years. We get nothing, nothing out of it. We have nothing, nothing except death and destruction. It's a horrible thing. And we saw what happened in Syria. Of course. I mean, so from the president's perspective, he's saying we got the border crisis. We have plenty of problems here at home. I don't want to be nation building anymore. The Sunnis should be stepping up. This is a mess someone else created. At the same time, though, if you pull out of Syria too quickly, you create a vacuum. ISIS, the caliphate has been defeated, but they've all fled into Turkey, Islamist Turkey, and they're still involved. You've got the Kurdish allies still not ready to stand up by themselves. And you've got Iran wanting to take over that entire vacuum and build a land bridge to our friends and in Israel. And what about so Russia, too? Who's Russia and, and Russia Syria? As well. Yeah, I think the president is too smart. Uh, he knows what happened when President Obama took his troops out of Iraq. He said, I didn't want the Iraq war, but man, it was a dumb move for him to do that. Look, it created ISIS. And the President Obama mocked said, uh, they're the JV team, and they turned out to be uh, more lethal than Al-Qaeda. General Jack Keane, unnerved by this, uh, came out last night and said, there's a reason why you have to still win the peace. What? Listen. We have to recognize that winning the conflict is not sufficient. You have to win the peace after that. That's what Obama walked away from. Bush won the war in Iraq. Obama lost the peace. The same thing in Libya. We deposed Gaddafi. The new regime came in, elected by its people, wanted some help to deal with the radicals. We said no. We lost the whole country. We're out of there. We lost our embassy. Uh, and it's a failed state. You've got to be willing to work the peace after the conflict. And I hope the president gets some advice from the new national security advisor to that effect. Your experience, General Mattis, General John Kelly serve on his cabinet. What would their advice be to the president? Well, I mean, he, he's hearing from a lot of different voices, all of which experienced the Iraq war. What happened there when Obama, as Brian said, pulled out too quickly. What you don't want is an Obama 2.0 right. scenario here where you've declared the end of the caliphate, so you pull all the troops out. The folks there that are supposed to keep the peace are not ready yet, and so the more active actors in Iran and Russia set the initiative and they take over, and now you've got a whole other power. Listen, Kuwait wrote a check for the first Persian Gulf War. Japan said, I can't give you troops, but I'll give you money. He wants Saudi Arabia to pay for our 2,000 troops there. I'm fine with that because we are doing their work. But there is not a person around the president, I believe, that would support him pulling out the troops. This could be a negotiation. It would be a disaster. I hope it's a negotiation. Yeah. It would be a disaster. I think All right. right. Let us know what you think. Jillian Mealy is here with Fox News Alert. Good morning. That's right. Good morning to you guys. Let's get right to that Fox News Alert and a story that we're following. Four Marines feared dead in a helicopter crash near the U.S. and Mexican border. The CH-53E Super Stallion Chopper, like the one you're seeing right now, went down in Southern California during a routine training mission. The names of those killed not yet released, and it's unclear at this point what went wrong. This is the deadliest crash for the Marine Corps since a cargo plane went down in Mississippi last July, killing all 16 aboard. To another alert, we now know police spoke to the YouTube shooter hours before she stormed their headquarters, shooting three people before killing herself. Police identifying the suspect as Nassim Agdim, an Iranian animal rights activist with a vendetta against YouTube. Authorities say they found her sleeping in her car after her family reported her missing. An active YouTuber, Agdim apparently told her family she was furious the company was no longer paying for her videos. They claim they warned police she, quote, might do something. New overnight, China announcing new tariffs worth $50 billion against the U.S. Soybeans and chemical products included in the 25% hike. It's seen as retaliation for tariffs announced by the White House late last night on things like industrial technology and medical products. The proposed 25% import tax is designed to push China to punish China. They're having revolts out there because there are a lot of areas, Orange County and others, they don't want to have sanctuary cities which are guarding criminals. And we've been covering that, so let's expand this. President Trump calling for action against sanctuary cities. And one New York state sheriff is signing up to take part in the immigration crackdown himself. Rensselaer County Sheriff Patrick Russo is here. He's the only New York state sheriff to sign to the federal immigration program that promotes cooperation between ICE and local law enforcement. Sheriff Russo, thanks so much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Tell us what 287G does. We sign up for a, a correctional component of 287G, and what that allows us to do is two of my correction officers will receive training by ICE, and we will be able to vet anybody that comes into our facility that's sent there by a judge for a crime and see if they're wanted by ICE, and if they are, we'll notify ICE, but we'll be able to do that in real time. Now, what, what's, the, what's hampering you now prior to this initiative? Well, they do, ICE does 
vet people in our facility, but it doesn't, it's not real time. So we want to prevent somebody from getting out before right. they're recognized as being wanted. But you can appreciate law enforcement with an expertise, therefore you do have some parameters. Uh, the officers will do this, they'll go through a four week basic training course. So screening will take place only for those arrested on criminal charges and overall there'll be a collaboration between the police and ICE. Right now, if an ICE official comes to your jail or, or somewhere else, is there somewhat friction that we're witnessing in California? Not at all. Not at all. We're going we're to cooperate with federal agencies. I would cooperate with ICE the same way I do with the DEA, with the FBI, Secret Service. I mean, cooperation amongst police agencies is paramount in providing good public safety. You wouldn't think this is about politics, but when you have a Democratic governor who might be looking at California and saying, I'm going to run for president, this might be a good thing for me to, to do, maybe I'll make this a sanctuary state. Governor Cuomo said this, or his office did, state police agencies do not and will not engage in such activity. And we are troubled that local sheriffs in the state have decided to participate. So he's not happy with this. No, and the governor has his job to do and I have my job to do. And uh, it's a shame this came down to being political because to me it's more public safety than politics. It's a sensible thing to do not to turn a criminal back out into the community. You're doing a disservice to the community. You're doing a disservice to the law enforcement officers that have to go back out and interact with that person. You have to remember the governor, no matter where he goes, he's protected by a contingent of armed state police. And when he goes to sleep at night, he's protected by a contingent yeah, of armed state us? police. The citizens right. of Rensselaer County don't have that protection, and, they depend on me. And last pushback, is, is some say it undermines the trust between immigrants and law enforcement. I don't believe that. I'm uh, in my 43rd year, starting my 43rd year as a law enforcement officer. I believe that people will not report crimes because they're more afraid of gangs, criminals, retribution than they are police. So, Governor, if the governor gives you a stand-down order, will, will Sheriff Russo stand down? I would think federal law would trump that. But that's for the attorneys to figure out. My, my, Pun intended. Me, me, to go, <laughs> me to go forward is cooperate with federal agencies. Okay. It doesn't look like he's going to take a backward step. Sheriff Patrick Russo, up early today. Thanks so much. Thank you very much for having you. me. Glad you're up. Hope you're dressed. Now here are some headlines. Another California city could turn on its own state today, fighting its sanctuary law. The city of Escondido, there we're seeing generic footage, will vote whether to file a legal brief supporting the Trump administration's lawsuit against California. At least one county and three cities have already taken action against California sanctuary policies. And California could become the first state to significantly restrict when a police officers could open fire. The proposal would prevent cops from shooting only if there were no uh, there were no other alternatives to deadly force. Critics say this is dangerous. To take that judgment element out of the equation is to effectively deny them the right to protect themselves. The proposal is backed by several lawmakers and the family of Stefan Clark, the unarmed black man. You're seeing some of this footage right here, uh, who was shot by police and protests have ensued. Let's go over the wall and down to the living room for Pete and Ainsley. <laughs> you the love doing of the that. Walk. <laughs> Thank you. you. Love doing that. <laughs> All Thank right. you. Thank you, Brian. Right, moving on, George Washington University is set to host a seminar this week that takes a closer look at, get this, Christian privilege and how Christians apparently get unmerited perks and have built-in advantages over non-Christians in the United States. Caroline Hakes is a campusreform.org correspondent and a freshman at GW, George Washington University. She joins us now to weigh in on this. So Caroline, what's happening on your campus? Well, the Multicultural Student Services Center is hosting this seminar on Christian privilege and I think I was very surprised to see this happening. Um, Christian groups on our campus generally enjoy um, a lot of um, acceptance by the university administration, although I'm sure there are some student groups who would disagree. Sure. Uh, you know, you, the namesake of your university, George Washington himself, a uh, white male Christian uh, who they would say enjoyed a great deal of privilege. Now, not, not setting aside the reality of, our, of race in this country, which we all understand, ultimately, and, and we need to address and have addressed, ultimately, I mean, is this not go to the heart? Why is it wrong to be a Christian, and how in the world does that lead to privilege? Well, as a Christian, I think that this is disappointing to see. I think that the premise of the seminar, although I'm sure well-intentioned, is misguided. You know, I personally was taught to love my neighbor as myself and that 
all of us are equal regardless of who we worship or the color of our skin. And so I really just hope that people uh, don't take this to heart. If anything, don't you feel like Christians are persecuted more now than, than ever in our country, or maybe not ever, but um, as of late? I think that this seminar is a symptom of the larger issue of um, elements of Christianity being downplayed on um, college campuses and in the mainstream media. We see it, for example, with um, lack of reporting on Christians being persecuted in the Middle East and with uh, TV personalities ridiculing Vice President Pence for expressing how his faith informs him in his office. Mm. Right. You talk about that persecution. We've got some numbers of what Christians face worldwide today. Over 200 million Christians face persecution on a regular basis, especially in the Middle East, as you, as you address. One in 12 Christians worldwide facing persecution. And the last one, Islamic oppression fuels persecution in eight of the top 10 countries. Do you, have you ever attended a workshop at GW about you know, radical Islamic oppression and what that does to people? You know, I have not, but we have discussed the effects of extremism in many of my classes. Um, I think that Islamic overall, extremism or extremism as sort of this amorphous idea? Extremism on um, several fronts. Sure. And I think that, you know, as we look abroad and we see what Christians across the world face, I think that we can say that here in the United States, we definitely are privileged in the sense that we are not you know, threatened with violence for our beliefs, but there are definitely some troubling things uh, going on. Campusreform.org has reported incidents on other campuses, such as Bible studies and fellowships being banned or having their funding taken away. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's something to look out for. All right, All right. Caroline Hakes, thank you so much. Make for sure you thank check you for your unmerited me. perks with that Christian privilege mm -hmm. next time you walk into <laughs> class. No in person in that. He class. felt like he was the superstar. He was Elvis. He was, he was on television uh, every I mean, Sean Duffy's well known, Christy known, but, but Tim was Elvis. And, and so I watched him, and I watched him turn down the presidency of our freshman class, which is hard to do for someone in politics. Anything that has the word president in it, you want it. <laughs> but he turned it down. Um, so I, I began to watch him and, and how strategic he was. And then it was one night, um, he showed a vulnerability that, that people at that level rarely do. I mean, he was just overwhelmed. Everyone wanted him to be the advocate for their cause. And I remember telling him at the Capitol Hill Club, you've earned every bit of capital you have. Nobody else was knocking on words in the Charleston heat. Nobody puts up with the things that he has to read on his Twitter feed and on his Facebook page. Spend your political capital the way you want to do it, not the way anyone else uh, That to me was the night uh, I think our relationship became a little more even. Absolutely. And this book talks about how you, you, you unified personally, but also can speak to our politics. And big, bold letters on the back of your book, it says, our nation is hungry for unity. Some would challenge that thesis and say, maybe it isn't. H how do you change that? Well, I think it is, actually. If you think about the fact that 80% of people have 80% of the things in common, the question is, how do we get there? And the reality of it is that politics has not been uh, the way that we get there. Trey and I found unity in Washington, but most of us will find it house to house. Mm -hmm. Having an unlikely friendship is about finding people who are not like yourself and spending time with them. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is we have